Hello, this is Professor James Strickler, and this is a course in American government. This lesson is from Unit 3 about American federalism, and this is Lesson 4 about the police power. In this lesson, you'll learn about retained powers, inalienable rights, delegated state powers, and police powers. Now, in previous lessons, we began building a model of American federalism. That model was based upon the idea that in the state of nature, we possessed all freedoms, powers, rights to do anything that we wanted. And those are represented by this gray circle. Now, Alexander Hamilton, who you've met previously in this course, one of the founding fathers who was at the Constitutional Convention, a member of the first uh, government after the elections following ratification of the Constitution, was an important politician in New York State who spoke at the state ratifying convention. And while at the convention, speaking in support of this new Constitution, he said that in the first formation of government, Every power of the community is delegated because every possible object is, should be administered by that government. Now, we talked a lot about this in a previous lesson about the potential massive amount of power that was being given to the state governments when they were first formed after the colonies had broken away from England. But there's a second part of this quote that we didn't really talk about then that I want to emphasize now. And that is at the end, he says, that nothing is reserved but the inalienable rights of mankind. So think about what he means by this quote. Nothing is reserved but the inalienable rights of mankind. He just got through talking about that every power is turned over to the state government it's created. But then he adds this exception, except these other things which are reserved. Well, what does that mean? Well, first of all, to understand what it means, we have to recognize that power that hasn't been delegated, in other words, hasn't been turned over, entrusted to somebody else, is reserved or retained by whoever originally had that power. So, in the first formation of government, when the people who in the state of nature have absolute power turn power over to a state government, um, whatever they do not give to that state government is what they reserve or retain to themselves. Now, Al Hamilton is saying that all power was turned over to the state governments, except what, some things were reserved, and those things were what he called the inalienable rights of mankind. Well, what are in unalienable rights? To understand that, let's go to the root of that word. Alien. What does alien mean? Now, when someone says alien, what may first come to mind is extraterrestrials. Or perhaps if you're thinking more politically, you'll think about, you'll think about foreigners, people who are coming from another country to the United States can also be called aliens. Now, the reason we use that word alien for someone who's coming from another country or from another world, in the case of an extraterrestrial, is because what alien really means is a thing that's separate, other or apart from us, that's different from who we are, that is sort of over there, away from us, not part of who we are. That's why the word alien can be used in the word alienable, which means a thing that can be separated or made apart, such as property being alienable. In other words, it's property that you can actually sell to someone else. So if alienable means a thing that you can separate from yourself, and unalienable, well, that's the, the way that uh, Alexander Hamilton said the word, but in our modern language, we tend to say inalienable. But if something is unalienable, what that means is that it cannot be separated from us. For some reason, we can't give it away. So now if we apply this to this idea of rights that he was talking about, an inalienable right is some power that we individually would possess in the state of nature that we are then unable to give to the state even if we wanted to. 
So Hamilton is saying in that first formation of government, when the people after the American Revolution formed their state governments, they turned all powers over to those state governments, except for these things that the, for one reason or another they couldn't give away. Now, what kind of things could they not give away? Well, inalienable rights were characterized in the Declaration of Independence, which was primarily written by Thomas Jefferson, as rights that we were endowed with by our Creator. In other words, God-given rights. So the idea in this quote is that God gave us certain freedoms when we were born into this world, and because he gave them to us, we are then not allowed to give them away to someone or something else. Now, that's one possible justification for the notion of unalienable or inalienable rights. There are other potential philosophical justifications for it. Now, this course isn't such that we can take a lot of time and talk about those. So for right now, just accept this notion that for people at the time of the founding, there was a belief that there were certain rights that couldn't be given away. Here in the Declaration of Independence, they're described as the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, whatever they may be, there's this idea that there are things that you could not give away to a state government. And Hamilton is saying that other than those, whatever they may be, all powers were given to the state government. So now let's return to this model that we're building of American federalism. So we have this big gray circle that we created in a previous lesson that we saw at the beginning of this lesson that represents all the powers that people would have in the state of nature. And then what we do is we're going to take a certain chunk of this big gray circle and we're going to now give it to the states. Well, how much? Well, Hamilton said a whole lot of it. Remember, he said, every power of the community is delegated, but the inalienable rights of mankind. So how are we going to represent that on our model? We're going to represent that with this big white circle now. This is going to show all those powers of the that were delegated to the community by individuals in the state of nature. So what we have left surrounding this white circle are those powers that were retained by individuals. What was described by Hamilton and by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence as unalienable rights. These are things that people did not turn over to the state, but retained for themselves. Things that they, in the state of nature, had complete freedom to decide for themselves. And even after the formation of government, at least in these limited areas, they're continuing to decide for themselves. Remember, in the state of nature, you have absolute power over all your decisions. And so areas of your power and freedom that you retain, that you don't turn over to the state, you would continue to have absolute authority over. That's why we call them rights. You get to decide those things. So there's these few unalienable rights that people would have power over, that they would retain for themselves. But then there would be this big chunk of power that they would turn over to the state as part of the social contract. Now, that big chunk of power that's been turned over to the state, there's a name that we use for it. It's called the police power. Now, why is it called the police power? Well, to understand that, you have to recognize what that word police really means. Now, normally when someone says police, what immediately comes to mind is police officers with handcuffs and badges and flashing lights and arresting people and that sort of thing. But that word police actually has a more general meaning. It can be used correctly if you were to tell somebody to police a kitchen, for example, which would mean to clean it up. And so when you realize that that word police can be used in both those situations, a cop on the street arresting a criminal and somebody cleaning up the mess in a dirty kitchen, you can recognize that the word police actually has a more broad meaning. It may, means to bring order to a thing. So when we talk about a state having the police power, what we mean by the state having the police power is that power has been delegated to that state from the people who were in the state of nature before they created that state government. Power has been delegated to that state to bring order, safety, and security to people's lives. 
just like a cop brings order to the streets by arresting criminals, or someone cleaning up a kitchen brings order to it by taking care of the mess that's there. The state, in general, brings order to people's lives. And the power that it has to bring order, then, is called the police power. Now, that police power has been defined by the United States Supreme Court in multiple cases as the power of a state to uh, regulate health, safety, morals, and the general welfare of the people. Now, just how broad of a power is this? Well, it's massively broad, giving the state power to address all kinds of things that you might not immediately think of a state doing. Particularly if you go back to around the time of the founding of the United States of America and look at some of the laws that were created by these states at this time, you can see just how incredibly broad this power is considered to be. Let me just give you two examples. Under the police power, which includes the power to regulate health, safety, welfare, and morals, the state of Massachusetts was able to, at the time of the founding, just shortly thereafter, pass this law regulating blasphemy in the state. Now, blasphemy, as it defines it, is defined in this law, is willfully saying something disrespectful or reproachful toward God or Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost, or it goes on against the scriptures, all these kind of things. And then it says that any person that's found offending in that way would be imprisoned up to a year, be fitted in the pillory, which was a uh, sort of a humiliation and torture device at the time, or whipped, or even fitted on the gallows, in other words, hung, depending on how bad their offense was and being disrespectful to God. So think about that for a moment. The state of Massachusetts thought it was fine at the time, under its police powers, to say, ah, that person disrespected God. They're behaving in an immoral manner. We as a state have the power, as a police power, to bring order into our community, including moral order. So in our view, that person's behaving in a morally incorrect way, and we're going to punish them for that. Give you a second example. In the state of Massachusetts, around the same time, another act regulated sexual behavior. It said, if a man shall lie with mankind as with a woman, it's talking about homosexual acts, or have carnal copulation of the beast, it's talking about bestiality, that the person would be sentenced to death and the beast slain, by the way. So notice this, that at the time in Massachusetts, homosexuality wasn't just illegal, but it could be punished with the death penalty. And in fact, these sorts of laws that we have in Massachusetts were things like blasphemy and uh, certain sexual behaviors being punished severely was common throughout the states at this time. This is what the police power meant to them. This is why Hamilton said that every power is given to the community other than the unalienable rights of mankind, whatever they may be. States could regulate just about anything in people's lives. So now let's review what we learned in this lesson. What are retained powers? Are they powers not reserved? Powers that were enumerated? Powers that were granted? Or powers that are not delegated? The correct answer is there's powers that, not, that are not delegated. At some point, some entity or group of people or whatever have powers, and then they delegate some of them or give them over to some other entity, perhaps a government they've created. The ones that they don't give over are the ones they retain or keep for themselves. What are inalienable rights? Rights that can't be given away. Rights enjoyed by foreigners. Rights assigned to the state. Or rights granted by the state. Well, as we learned, that word inalienable means that you can't give it away. So inalienable rights are rights that cannot be given away, even if you wanted to give them away. What powers were delegated to states? Natural powers, inalienable rights, enumerated powers, or police powers? Now, you may be confused here that, that uh, one possibility there are enumerated powers may remind you of where you've previously been taught about powers being given to the national government, which were enumerated powers. But the powers given to the states were not enumerated. Instead, they were this broad grant of police powers. Do whatever you need to do to bring order to the community. So police powers is the correct answer. 
And what are police powers? Are police powers the, the power to regulate taxing and spending? Regulate safety and welfare? Regulate speech and the press? Or regulate imports and exports? Now, while potentially police powers could be used for all these things, the way they were defined by their purpose is that they are powers to regulate safety and welfare. All right, that does it for this lesson about the police power. The next lesson, lesson five of unit three, will be about national powers.